Welcome back to Think Tech. Here we are on Energy in America, and we are joined by Skype uh, with Jeff Kissel of the Washington, D.C. Um, based Energy Policy Research Foundation, and that's EPRINC. Uh, we're going to discuss today gasoline taxes as a way to enable um, re proper the, the, and properly reform the U.S. tax system. Are gasoline taxes the way to save tax reform? And this is a very current question. You know, most of the revenue initiatives to save tax reform are not, are not making it, and Congress may not be um, you know, able to do it. Um, such as the border adjustment tax, the carbon tax, the $8 billion we've heard about for, to enable the, uh, the new version of, uh, what do you want to call it, Trump health care. Um, we have a reduction in, in uh, the individual income tax, a reduction coming in the corporate income tax, uh, not saying whether that's fair or not. Um, we have um, the elimination of the estate tax. Uh, we have $54 billion as, that Trump has uh, suggested he wants to go to the military. And we have, what, I think 10 or more for the wall he wants to build uh, on Mexico. And we have an existing $20 trillion deficit. And in order to enable tax reform on top of all these spending programs, my goodness, how are we going to do it? And Jeff Kissel is here with us to discuss one possible answer. Hi, Jeff. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jay. It's a great it's a great privilege and an honor to be here. I, I, even though I'm wearing a, a necktie today because I'm in New York, aloha. Aloha. So, what do you think? I mean, what you know? What? How serious is this? Uh, these these various um, vectors on on tax reform. How serious is tax reform? Where does it stand now? And and uh, what do you think about the possibility of using gas tax, gasoline taxes, um, to make it more possible? Well, at the Energy Policy Research Foundation, we are uh, always looking objectively at, at the most logical outcome and, the, and assessing the costs. And unfortunately, it's as serious as a heart attack, as they once said. The, the issue is, where can you get consensus in order to uh, raise some money to offset the cost of the various programs that the administration wants to put forward? So it's not just tax reduction, it's spending increases. Mm -hmm. And the federal gasoline tax has not been raised since 1993. Now state and, and municipalities have raised gasoline taxes all over the country. And I have some slides that, that show you just exactly where they are. Um, and of course, if you, if you look at the slides, on slide one, we've got a little map of the country and it shows the average price of gasoline and then it looks at, it's color coded, not red and blue for Republican and Democrat, but red for high gasoline taxes and so on down the line. And, and of course, the democratically leaning states have got high gasoline taxes now. And I don't think that the administration sees any risk in asking that those taxes go higher. Wow. So, you know, on the, on the other side, uh, on the side of how this affects, you know, the, the way the country works. Granted that there's been no increase since 1993, um, but, you know, it's a world that's different since 1993. How is this going to affect the way transportation works? How is it going to affect, if, if it happens, of course, uh, how is it going to affect the way energy works? Well, unfortunately, in the short term, and if you look at if you look at my second slide, you'll see the national average. We don't have them available taxes, right now, Jeff. We'll try to get them. per gallon, uh, uh, state uh, as well as other excise taxes, and then federal taxes. You you will realize that the states that consume the most gasoline, of course, are not only paying the highest tax in absolute sense now, but they're going to pay the highest gross dollars because they drive the most. Now, yeah. Hawaii is fortunate because we don't drive that far, but our, our cost of fuel is among the highest in the country. And Hawaii's very enlightened government, in my opinion, is doing the right thing to move us away from uh, traditional fuels for our, our transportation sector into renewable fuels, which are looking more and more attractive, the more expensive these, these taxes and other costs get. Well, I get three things out of that. Number one is uh, we will be affected if there is uh, an increase in the, the gas tax, the federal gas tax, in order to alleviate, you know, these other problems and allow for some kind of tax reform, as he wants. 
Um, but the second thing is uh, I, we will not be paying as much as other states because we don't drive as much as other states. But the third thing is, um, gee whiz, uh, um, you know, this suggests uh, that it, the, best, the best approach is to, you know, accelerate the idea of having renewable uh, energy uh, in our transportation here in Hawaii. And that's been a subject of discussion here on Think Tech for some time. It's been a subject of discussion uh, be, with the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum for four or five years at least. And I would, I would have to say that uh, there hasn't been much, um, you know, much movement on that. We, we have a lot of discussions, but uh, we haven't really gotten to the point where we can say that people are on a, a track to uh, get off gas cars, gasoline cars, fossil fuel cars, and into electric cars or uh, some other approach. I don't think rail necessarily um, makes a big dent in it. I don't think bicycles make a big dent in it, although that's nice to have on other levels. Um, we, we need to go electric cars. Do you, do you agree? And what is your suggestion in any event for Hawaii to move to renewables in transportation? Well, speaking of tracks, we, we did bring up rail and we, we did bring up dents. So, you know, that... That's that good about the, the rail and the tracks. What to yeah. do about automobiles. <laughs> um, we've gotten about as much efficiency out of the conventional single or, or dual passenger transportation vehicle as we are going to get, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter very much whether that is a, a Honda Civic or a Chevy Volt. Each one of those, if you, if you do the re right math, uses about the same amount of carbon producing resources to move its passengers around. What we've got to do is look at ways to get people to either share vehicles or in other cases, get into buses and, and work closer to their, their places of living and, and schooling and shopping. And if you look at that carefully, you start to think about the, the real alternatives. It, it is clear that we are on a path to driverless vehicles. Driverless vehicles can offer a huge improvement in vehicle efficiency because in, in the first instance, you can put more people in them because you can program them to pick up people and, and deposit people more efficiently. And in the second instance, they actually can work on, on more renewable resources than uh, conventional uh, gasoline and conventional electric cars. No, yeah, well, they work That's best a, with electric, don't they? I mean, I, I try to envision a, a, a fossil fuel car as an autonomous vehicle. It's hard to do that because, you know, the systems are so different. Um, wouldn't it be, I mean, does, isn't it clear that uh, you really are not, as a matter of fact, you're not going to have automated cars without having electric cars. The two go hand in glove, yeah. Well, that's one of the best matches, but you can certainly have an internal combustion engine in a driverless vehicle, mm -hmm. even if the, the engine just runs an electric generator. You mm -hmm. know, 90% of, of the ships hauling freight all over the world today are electric. The diesel engines run generators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so the mode of, of propulsion it is not the critical item. It's the technology for the and the algorithm algorithm, sorry, that people use to determine where to pick up and deposit the passengers. The ele elevators are, are a great example of that today. If you go into some of the office buildings in downtown Honolulu, you no longer have elevator buttons inside the cabs. You 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 announce where you want to go when you enter the lobby. Uh, by entering your floor on a control panel. And that computer inside the elevator decides what floor is going to get the most traffic, and it, it organizes the elevator to be at that floor when the traffic comes. And, and it's predictive. Driverless vehicles can do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just a question of, of technology and data collection. Yeah, it's exciting data to think that is, we, is we're on the cusp of that, and there are so many people working on it. Every time you pick up a newspaper, you know, you hear about some other large, you know, national or multinational company, um, you know, initiating a, an effort to do research on, 
on, um, on, on driverless cars. But let me, let me go to the point of uh, the, the fuel for a moment. Um, if, if uh, I mean, do you feel, do you feel that we can enter, you know, into renewable cars uh, in accordance with the Hawaii target date now? I don't know if that bill passed, but there was a bill that was in the legislature until a couple of weeks ago, it looked like it was going to pass, um, to require or at least a, an aspirational goal of 100% uh, renewables in transportation uh, the same year as the electrical generation renewables target 2045. Um, so assuming it passed for a moment, I don't know if it did, but assuming it passed, how are we going to reach that? Um, renewables um, seem to be the way. Uh, and the question I put to you, Jeff, is uh, in a state where everybody loves fossil fuel cars and there hasn't been any significant movement to electric cars, you know, I think 5,000 in the state, and that's really not a drop in the bucket, how are we going to get there? Well, the aspirational goals are important because unless you have a goal out there, you, you don't really know how to make progress. You can't measure your progress. So whether it's 2045 or some other year, is much less important than having a goal. Mm -hmm. And I admire and, and commend the leadership for, for wanting a goal. The second issue is how to get there. Well, it is illegal in this country, as far as I know, um, to employ undocumented uh, aliens. Yet we employ many, many millions of them. It's illegal to cheat on your income tax. Yet. Other than you and I, I know that there are other people who cheat on their income tax. You, you're, you're not going to, you're, you're not going to get full compliance. What you want to do is incent compliance, and states like Hawaii are taking a leadership position in providing incentives for compliance. California has got a great incentive for compliance. If you want to get in the carpool lane, you either get more than one person in your car or you get a zero emission vehicle. And you know, with the, the, the traffic jams that go on for 30, 40, and 50 miles in the state of California, that's a great incentive. And, and they've got a lot of compliance. Yeah, well Technology that's how you change, change human conduct. Catch up change human conduct by, by having there. a... And if you look at my third slide, you, yeah. you see the relationship of gasoline prices in California to the real world. I couldn't find a Hawaii graph on short notice, but Hawaii is slightly higher than the California line in, in, in this instance. So there is more, the higher those prices go, the more incentive there is for people to do other things than sit alone in their car in traffic. Mm -hmm. Chef, we'll take a short break if you don't mind. Uh, that's Jeff Kissel of ePrink. Uh, we're talking about gasoline taxes as a way to save tax reform that's pending in Congress right now. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back and we'll continue the discussion as it affects Hawaii. You're watching ThinkTech on thinktechhawaii.com, which broadcasts five live talk shows from noon to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then streams our earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on ThinkTech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here and my Past blogs can be found at kawilucas.com. Okay, I didn't listen. Okay, we're back. We're live with Jeff Kissel of ePrink, uh, uh, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C., but he joins us by Skype from New York. Uh, and he, uh, I think he stayed up late. It must be uh, 9.15 over there. Thank you for staying up late, Jeff. Well, fortunately, the hockey playoffs are not on tonight, so uh, I've, got a, I've got a pass to talk to you. Priorities, priorities. So we're talking about ways to save tax reform, to have tax reform, 
you know, I mean, of course, uh, it strikes a lot of people, this is just exactly the wrong time to have tax reform uh, because uh, President Trump, he wants to spend money on a bunch of other things. And so it's, it's hard to see this as a, uh, you know, a balance, as a net balance. Uh, it, rather, it looks like we're going to go into the, uh, into the hole and, and we're going to wind up with spending a lot more than we're making. Um, and, th and that sounds more like a democratic process than, than a Republican one, but hey, we'll see what happens. And your suggestion is that gasoline taxes could be a way to you know, create or at least help a balance that would enable tax reform uh, in Congress right now. Um, do, you think, do you think that, um, that gasoline taxes would be substantial enough? I mean, how, how much tax, how much rate, what rate of tax would we have to charge? Uh, what things would we have to do to raise enough money to make a significant impact on on the federal budget, which is huge, and the and the uh, you know the um, uh, the budget deficit is likewise huge. Uh, isn't that kind of isn't gasoline taxes in the larger sense a drop in the bucket? Well, you you make a good point, Jay. But at least the, if they can drive consensus on raising the gasoline tax, which is likely. Mm -hmm. then they can say with a straight face, at, at least for a, a fraction of a second, that they have made an effort to pay for the cost of the health care reform that they intend to introduce and the tax reform that they intend to introduce. Now, I, I, I personally don't think that this is, is very useful and the statistics don't bear them out because the statistics tell us that the higher you raise the price of a commodity, the less people use it. Yeah. And I, I don't think they can shut off the law of supply and demand. They may be able to stretch it for a while. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but what you said, and I, I find this interesting, you said that um, they, they could reach consensus on this. And that's an interesting phenomenon. And, and it suggests that while the public, you know, may be excited about um, existing conditions under the, on the health care, uh, the, the second iteration of the health care bill, the Trump health care bill, they, and they get excited about that. They would not get excited about uh, a dramatic increase in, in uh, gasoline tax. Why is that? I mean, do people well, not care? Well, unfortunately, in the United States, um, the haves and the have-nots are, are suffering a, a, a great divide. And you could impose a gasoline tax, which affects the working poor more than it affects the middle class and upper middle class and super rich. And, and the working poor are unlikely to retaliate, whereas the, the, the more affluent have got access to lobbyists who are going to do everything they can to make sure that that corporate tax rate comes down and the individual rate comes down and the estate tax goes away. So it's a question of who's got the most muscle to do what, what, what can be done, not what should be done. Yeah, but you know, it reminds me of um, some of the um, senators who um, had visits from their constituents. I'm thinking of a, one fellow in uh, Arkansas, I think it was, where um, a relatively young fellow, and he was uh, supporting the Trump uh, health care reform, or health care bill, I shouldn't necessarily say reform. Um, and they, his constituents came and stood at his door for days and hours. Uh, they made a racket outside the federal building where his office was. Um, they didn't leave him alone for a minute. And when, he, when they finally got him into a meeting, uh, they were very angry. And uh, that was because of the health care issue. And I suggest that the uh, you know, existing, existing conditions um, provision in the health care bill now contemplated um, uh, you know, uh, that is a hot button issue. Um, don't you think, that, and that affects the poor people more than the rich ones, more than the middle class for that matter. Um, don't you think, well, we, we've already established that an increase in gas, uh, pro, uh, gas taxes will affect the poor people more than the middle class and the rich people because they can't afford it. It's a, it's a regressive tax. A gas tax is a regressive tax. Why are people not concerned in the same way? Do they not realize that the gas tax will hurt them? Are they just not aware of the impact it has on, on, on their lives and their driving habits? I think that the gas tax increase is a more moderate shock to the system than a health care uh, increase. 
So um, if, if a person today uh, on the Affordable Care Act is paying four or $500 a month, and that were to jump to $1,500 a month, as it likely will if they repeal, repeal the act, that's a huge shock to the system. They can't afford it. But if they're paying $100 a week for gasoline now, and they're going to have to pay $120 a week um, in the near term if they raise the gas tax by, let's just say, 50 cents a gallon, then what's going to happen really is the working poor are going to find themselves with less money for education, for the necessities of life, but not so much less that it, it will cause them to take time off from their precious hours of work or, or give up that second job to march on their Congress representatives. Yeah. This reminds me of the political process in Hawaii that led recently, you must have followed it, um, to this tax on hotels, a 12.5% increase in, on the uh, uh, hotel tax. Uh, I don't know if that's law yet, but uh, that was pretty surprising and shocking um, that uh, in order to cover what rail or whatever else they needed the money for, um, they were, they were going to tax the tourists 12.5 percent. And it, was, it seemed to be a decision in a vacuum because uh, tourism is our primary you know, product. It's our, the engine of our economy. And I don't know if people in the legislature were thinking of what happens to tourism when you add 12.5 percent. Um, it, it, it could be that that has a negative effect. Um, but I guess, the, I guess the thought, just as you point out in the, in the case of the gas tax, is that it's not a hot button issue, at least not for the local people. They don't pay it. Um, and it may not be a hot button issue for the tourists because they don't realize it. Um, so I guess when you do tax reform along these lines, you're primarily interested in how the constituent group, whatever it is, is going to react to it rather than the ripple effect on the economy. Is, is that good logic? Is that good government? Well, it, 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 may be, it may be consensus politics. It certainly is not thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, taking more money out of the tourist economy is putting Hawaii on a more precarious edge than it already is because it is dependent upon a single industry. Yes. And when this economy falters, that industry falters, and we all know that. And it takes jobs out of the economy. It takes a very long time, as we all know, to recover from whether it's an economic shock or a physical shock. Yeah, we've seen that. So uh, one, one thing I wanted to pose to you was uh, the notion of increasing the gas taxes on a federal level. If over the next few years, um, and maybe in the next administration, uh, we find that renewables increase, um, then whatever rate of gas tax is established in order to enable the tax re the current tax reform bill um, is likely to be flattered down because there's less gas being used on the highways. Um, so uh, how, would you, how would you account for that? Uh, if we need the money in order to enable the tax reform, will we have the money going forward, assuming that somewhere along the line here we start using renewables seriously on America's highways? The higher you raise the price of gasoline, the less gasoline is going to be consumed. So when the administration talked about a death spiral for Obamacare, it really was kind of duplistic in, in what it was saying, because raising the gas, gas tax puts energy consumption and accordingly highway revenue into its own death spiral. Yeah, right. One works on the other. And so it's again, it's a matter of being thoughtful and a matter of seeing into the future and trying to figure out the relationships. And it's especially so when you're talking about tax reform against spending, against maintaining a, a budget. But one thing that occurs to me, though. J, if, if we're going to improve our, our roads and highways to the point where we can use autonomous vehicles, automated transportation, we're going to have to spend more on that infrastructure, not less. Well, and, and who knows, um, you know, what, what the future will bring. But one thing seems clear is that every time you look, the federal government is uh, undertaking more expense and more complexity, uh, more people, more technology, uh, more infrastructure, as you mentioned. And so we are always going to be looking. People are always going to be expecting the government to do more and spend more. And it's very hard to balance the budget that way. That's why we're 
20 trillion dollars in the hole. But let me offer another thought though, Jeff. Um, you know, we should be looking for various ways to soften this kind of negative tax reform where we're cutting taxes and increasing spending. Whoa. Um, but one, one thing that does pop into my mind from this discussion, and especially something that you guys deal with all the time, is the notion of a carbon tax. And I mean, it hasn't gotten that far, um, but arguably if it were enacted, there would be some money coming out of that and it would be an incentive for renewables on a national basis. I know this is not likely in the Trump administration, but let's put that aside for a minute and just talk about it theoretically. If we had a carbon tax, would that help in balancing the budget? Would it help in achieving tax reform? We already do have a carbon tax. The excise taxes on transportation fuels amount to about $50 a ton of carbon that is, is in those fuels and discharged into the um, uh, environment. So it's not implementing one, it's whether or not we're going to raise it. Yes. But what about expanded? Are there other areas, I mean, outside of transportation, for example, where uh, a carbon tax could be implemented uh, in industry and in, who knows, in electrical generation, um, in, you know, other places and situations where we use carbon, where we don't have to use carbon, where we could use Hawaii, more efficient Hawaii's environmental. Hawaii's had a carbon tax for many years. It's called the barrel tax. Yes, and indeed. They've, they've raised it. They've raised it as well. And I, I haven't done the numbers on the cost per ton of carbon, but it is very substantial. It's certainly more than the $50 a ton that we're paying in our transportation fuels. So if you were to add that to the $50, which it is, uh, you, you, your Hawaii is probably paying well over $100 a ton in carbon tax. And, you know, as we have seen, it doesn't necessarily act as the incentive we had hoped it would. It's so interesting. Also, on the other side of it, it doesn't necessarily stick because the legislature has raided the, uh, you know, the proceeds of the, uh, the, uh, the, the barrel tax for every year that the barrel tax has existed. So that's an, it, you know, it was a great idea, but an imperfect uh, implementation. Well, let me leave you with a minute, Jeff, to uh, address President Trump on this issue. Uh, what would you advise him in the circumstances of this potential tax reform he is seeking? Don't reform, Mr. President. The, the tax system right now is, is cumbersome, it's unfair, it's difficult. But the reforms that are being undertaken are going to cause a significant widening of the gap between rich and poor, not because of the tax rates on the rich and the tax rates on the poor, but because they are going to widen the deficit. And unless you're going to reduce spending, you cannot afford to reduce taxes. Yes, sir. It's all about maintaining you know, balance, and it's all also about uh, avoiding a disparity between income groups. Well, thank you so much, Jeff Kissel. Jeff Kissel of EPRINC uh, joins us to discuss uh, tax policy in the U.S., and the question today has been, are gasoline taxes the way to save tax, tax uh, reform pending now in Congress? Thank you so much, Jeff. I hope we can talk again soon. It's a pleasure, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.